Today we're going to begin our discussion on cellular level of organization, and specifically we're going to focus on the plasma membranes. So this is what a plasma membrane looks like, and it raises the question, how do membranes enable life to exist? Really the way they do, and you'll see this throughout the lecture, is that membranes allow for a barrier to separate molecules from one side of the membrane from the other side, and allow you to create something called a concentration gradient, a difference in concentration of molecules. This difference allows the movement of molecules uh, across the membrane, which enables chemical reactions to occur. So these are our learning objectives for today. And as always, you want to make sure you can execute these learning objectives before you proceed to the next lecture. OK, so let's talk about the basic membrane structure. Uh, and it can be identified as something called the lipid bilayer. And this is a picture of it right here. You'll notice we have a spherical uh, shaped membrane. And if you look closely within that black box at the bottom, you could see that we actually have this bilayer structure, right? We have a layer of something and then a layer of something else underneath it. And basically, it's the mirror image of itself. This is the lipid bilayer. We have fluid on the outside of the membrane. We have fluid on the inside. The fluid on the outside is called extracellular fluid. Oops, excuse me one second. Grab my, my pen here. Okay, so the fluid on the outside is called extracellular fluid, whereas the fluid on the inside is called intracellular fluid. Membranes consist of a bilayer, and this basically allows for uh, a property of the membrane, something we call selectively permeable. All right, so selectively permeable. And what that means is certain things can pass through the membrane, certain things cannot. Okay, if we blow up a section of that membrane, so we take that black box, we blow it up, we have a cross section through this lipid bilayer. You can see this is one layer of lipid, and this is another layer of the lipids. Also, you can see that the top portion and the bottom portion, we have these tiny little lipid heads, and these regions here that I just circled are called hydrophilic, or they're water-loving, they're polar. Whereas the main portion on the inside here, so from here to here where I have the arrow, that's something called hydrophobic or water-hating. And what we mean by hydrophobic or water-hating is that it is afraid of water or it hides from water. And that's really called nonpolar as well. Okay, if we blow up a certain lipid here, we could see that we have a single lipid. And again, I'm emphasizing here, here's the hydrophilic part which is this region here, right, in this region here. And then here's that fatty acid tail that's hydrophobic. Phobic in Greek comes from the Greek word phovama. It means I'm afraid, right? So it's afraid of water. And so this region here I just boxed is that internal region right there. The lipids have three different types of movements we want to keep, about, keep in mind, too. So uh, each individual phospholipid can spin along its longitudinal axis. It can flip from one side of the membrane to the other, and it can vibrate or bounce back and forth. And this is what really allows for the movement of molecules across the membrane. Okay, so what are the mechanisms by which substances cross the membranes? Well, there's about five that we're going to talk about today. There's something called diffusion, something called passive transport, something called active transport, something called endocytosis, and something called exocytosis. Let's go ahead and talk about these. And the first three I'm going to focus on, if I back up a second, are these three. I like to think of these three going together and then these two going together. Okay, so before we can talk about diffusion, the first one on our list, we have to talk about a few terms first. So we're backing up a second. And what's the first term? The first term is what is something called a concentration. We see this at the top of the slide. And a concentration really is the number of molecules per unit area. So if I looked on this particular slide, I would start counting, right? I'd say there's one molecule, there's two, there's three, there's four, five, let's keep going, right? Six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. So there's 10 molecules per box, right? 10 molecules per unit area. That's a concentration. What's a concentration gradient? Concentration gradient is basically saying you have two different regions, right? So we have one box on this side and we have another box on this side and they're separated by some type of barrier. And in our case, it would be what? It would be our plasma membrane that would go right through the middle here. And so really what it's saying is if we have a concentration gradient, we have more molecules on one side, the left in this case, right, right here, and then we have less molecules on the other side of the barrier, on the right. That's a gradient. Right, the difference in the concentration of molecules on one side of the membrane versus the other. In the absence of other forces, what happens is the molecules will keep bouncing into each other. It's something called Brownian motion. So I'd write that down, right? Brownian motion. The molecules are vibrating back and forth. And what happens over time is molecules will go from a high concentration gradient from the left to a low concentration gradient to the right. It looks something like this. This will continue until we basically reach something called an equilibrium that we'll talk about a little bit later. Okay, so now that we have those terms in mind, let's talk about uh, what diffusion is. 
And so what diffusion is, is it's the net movement of molecules or ions down a concentration gradient. It's what you just saw at the bottom of the previous slide. Okay, so these molecules collide randomly, right? But the net movement will be down the concentration gradient. So from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. If we look at diffusion of a dye in water, so sort of the example we're going to use at the bottom, let's drop some dye in that water. So we drop some dye molecules. They're all concentrated, right? They're all near each other when you first drop them in, but then they're going to start bouncing back and forth through Brownian motion. And what's going to happen is over time they're going to diffuse. So it's going to look something like that. They'll spread throughout the whole uh, beaker. Okay, so that brings up the next question, was, which is what substances can diffuse across a selectively permeable membrane? So if we have our membrane here, we have our lipid bilayer, right? So here's one layer of lipids, here's the other. Uh, we would say that molecules that are small will pass through more easily than molecules that are large, which that sort of makes sense, right? Because these, remember these lipids are vibrating back and forth, they're moving. Uh, something that's small can slip through a smaller pore than something that's large. On the other hand, though, we want to also consider a different factor. So something that's nonpolar, right, which we see right here, will pass through the membrane more easily than something that's polar. All right, and so the polar is represented on the right here. That can't really pass through as easily. And you might say, well, why is this? And this is really why. If we look at the length of the trip, we would say that these polar heads are these regions here that I'm circling on either side of the membrane, right? That's a small region of the trip. Whereas this huge internal portion is the nonpolar portion of the membrane that we spoke of before. And so something that's nonpolar can get through the membrane much more easily because basically nonpolar likes nonpolar, right? Nonpolar is afraid of polar, and then vice versa for the polar molecule. So what happens is the nonpolar molecule has a hard time getting through this region here and this region here, but it's such a small portion of the membrane, it doesn't really matter, right? The large portion of the truck is the nonpolar here, and the nonpolar molecule has no problem getting through because most of the track is easy for it. Whereas the polar has an easy time getting through here and here, but look at this huge region by the arrow right there that's nonpolar has a hard time getting through there. So that's why something that's small and nonpolar can get through the membrane much more easily than something that's large and polar. Okay, so different things affect the rate of diffusion. You might say, what is that that just popped up? Well, the Cubs must electrify the pirates. This is a little mnemonic that I use to remember the different factors that affect the rate of diffusion, right? So how fast something diffuses or some molecule diffuses across the membrane. Uh, the first letter of each of those words tells you what the factors are, except for that second the just doesn't exist, right? But I had to have that there to have the sentence be grammatically correct. Let's look at those, these though. So what, is, what are the factors that affect the rate of diffusion? How fast something diffuse? And these are things that you want to make sure that you know, obviously. The first is T, right? The, T. Temperature. You increase the temperature, you increase the rate of diffusion. The second is C, right, for cubs, the concentration gradient. In other words, the larger the gradient, right, the larger the difference in concentration between the two sides, the faster molecules are going to diffuse across that gradient. The next one is M. The bigger the molecular size, the lower the rate of diffusion, right? Bigger things are going to be moving more slowly than uh, small things. Number four, electrify, uh, stands for electric charge. So what this is saying is if on one side of the membrane you have a positive charge and at the other side of the membrane the molecules are negatively charged, that will increase the rate of diffusion because positive and negative charges attract. So the increased difference in charge increases the rate of diffusion. And then finally, P for pirates uh, stands for pressure. And so what this is saying is if you apply a pressure, a high pressure to one side of the membrane and there was a low pressure on the other, basically things would diffuse more quickly across the membrane, which makes sense. It's literally like you're squeezing things across the membrane. Okay, so now that we've looked at that, let's go ahead and focus on the next two things that go with this first set of three. So we focused on diffusion, right? We talked about that. But let's see how that relates to passive and active transport. Okay, so the first thing we have to do before we can have that discussion is acknowledge this. Acknowledge that the membrane is not just a lipid bilayer, but rather it's something we call the fluid mosaic model, right? It's a fluid mosaic model. And you may say, well, what do we mean by this? What we mean, just like a mosaic painting has all these little like pieces pasted together, like a bunch of puzzle pieces put together, a cell membrane has a bunch of uh, different puzzle pieces as well. So the lipid bilayer is the main portion, right, which is all the way across here. We talked about that already. But you'll also see we have a bunch of proteins throughout the membrane, a bunch of carbohydrates, and then other factors as well. And so what it's saying is there's a lot of different components to this membrane, and some of these 
components, particularly the proteins, uh, might affect transport of, transport of molecules across the membranes. Let's take a look at that. So let's look at active and trans, passive transport, excuse me, and what the difference is between active and tra passive transport. Okay, so here's our membrane. We have our lipid bilayer, right? And then we have three different scenarios here. So the first is diffusion, the next is passive transport, the third is active. Let's look at them. What it's saying is on the top of this slide, you'll notice we have a well, concentration gradient, right? And so we have a high concentration of molecules at the top of the membrane. We have a low concentration at the bottom. And what's going to happen is, in the absence of other issues, what's going to happen in the first step is if something can diffuse across the membrane, if it's small and nonpolar, it will. All right, that's diffusion. We talked about that already. The next thing I want to talk about is passive transport. If something can pass through the membrane, but it needs the aid of a protein, let's say it's a little too big or a little too polar to pass the lipid bilayer by itself. So if it needs a protein, but it's passing down the concentration gradient, then it's called passive transport. On the other hand, if we need a protein, but we're going up the concentration gradient, so notice the difference in this last arrow here, we're going up, that's something called active transport. And that relies on uh, energy. So you need something called ATP to make that happen. And so really when we talk about the difference of passive versus active transport, it's the direction in which things are moving, right? Either down the concentration gradient or up, and then whether or not energy is required. Okay, let's focus on the last two things here. So endocytosis and exocytosis. These sort of go together. And really what this is, is both of these are part of something called membrane cycling. You might say, what is membrane cycling? Really what it is, is it's having a cell membrane and it's using that membrane and bubbling it out or bubbling it in to aid in transport of mass quantity of molecules. So it's a slow process, but you get a lot of uh, substances across the membrane. I think of it as like a cargo ship almost, like, you know, hauling a huge amount of freight. So it's slow, but you get a lot of, um, you know, a lot of uh, freight across or a lot of molecules across. So the first process is something called endocytosis. And what endocytosis is saying is the molecules are starting on the outside of the membrane. So the top of this uh, slide is the outside of the membrane. The bottom, where the star is, that's the inside of the membrane, or sorry, inside of the cell, I should say. So the top is outside of the cell, the star is inside of the cell. Uh, we have our membrane, as you can see it. If molecules are starting on the outside of the membrane, and what's happening is they're pushing the membrane in, right? And eventually the membrane bubbles off and has all these molecules inside. That's called endocytosis. Whereas if we have the opposite, so the exact same picture, except notice that the arrows are pointing the other way, right? We start with material inside. It merges with the membrane, and then that material flows outside. That process is called exocytosis, and exo in Greek means outside. Okay, the final thing I want to talk to you about in this lecture is something called tonicity and osmosis. So whenever we talk about diffusion of molecules, the molecules that are, that are dissolved in any solution, right? In biology, we focus on water usually. But the molecules that are dissolved in that solution are called the solute. Right? And so, so far we've talked about dissolute diffusing across the membrane or passing through with active transport or passive transport. What if the solute can't get across the membrane? Then what happens is water will move to try to even out the concentration gradient. So that's sort of a key here. And that movement of water is called osmosis. Okay, so let's give you an example here. So you have three different scenarios here. So these three columns are three scenarios, right? Uh, the top of each column is a little cartoon picture. Uh, at the bottom is an actual picture of, of some cells. So let's say we have a bag, right? And this bag is supposed to represent a cell at the top. And that bag has a sucrose solution. Let's say it's 2%. I want to re represent the sucrose molecules by these little red spheres. Okay, so let's put some red spheres in there. Let's look at three different scenarios and see if the sucrose cannot move back and forth back and forth across that bag, right, or across that membrane. Let's see what happens, um, you know, to the water instead. Okay, so that's the premise of all of this. The sucrose cannot move, but the water can. Let's see what direction the water moves to even out the concentration gradient. Okay, so the first scenario is this. We have um, a bunch of solute, right, a bunch of sucrose in that bag, and we have very, very little or no sucrose in the beaker. So you'll notice that in the bag we have a lot, and in the beaker, look, there's, there's nothing, right? That's a situation where we say it's called a hypotonic condition. Hypo means too little. You might say too little what? Too little of the solute, too little of the sucrose in the beaker. And that's very important on this whole thing here. So that's the reference point, right? 
Whenever we say hypotonic, or these other terms I'll tell you in a second, it refers to the solution in the beaker relative to the solution in the cell. We have to have that directional reference, otherwise these won't make sense. So what happens then? So if there's too little solution in the beaker, right? So it's hypotonic, there's too much in the uh, cell, and the solute can't move, the sucrose can't move, to even out the concentration gradient, water is going to move into the cell to dilute the molecules that are inside the cell. That's called hypotonic condition. And what happens is the cell would actually burst if that happens. And so that's why you don't really, um, uh, when you're giving someone an IV at the hospital, you don't just inject water because this would happen to their cells, right? Uh, they would burst. But rather what you do is you inject some type of saline solution. Okay, now that we took some time on that first one here, and these are pictures at the bottom here right, to show you what the cells look like, um, let's look at the next two, and these will go a little bit more quickly now that you have a hang of it. Okay, scenario two, we drop that sucrose into that second beaker, and what we see in this situation is, let's say we have a ton of solute, a ton of sucrose in the beaker, and we have very little inside the cell, right, relative to the beaker, so it's a ton in the beaker. What's going to happen is this is a hypertonic solution. So what we're saying is hypertonic, hyper means too much, too much what? Too much solute or too much sucrose in the beaker. Again, remember our relative reference there that we have. So what happens then? Water's going to rush out of the cell, right, in order to compensate and the cell's going to shrivel. The final situation is where we drop that uh, solution or that uh, cell into beaker three and we have the same amount of solutes in the cell as we do in the beaker. So everything's sort of happy, right? Everything's equal. That's called isotonic condition. And in that sense, we have no net movement of water back and forth. So water's moving, but you know, in a net sense, it's equaling out. The amount of water moving into the bag is the same as the amount of water moving out of the bag. Okay, so uh, basically this is an issue of osmosis and these different um, uh, concentrations of solute we have refer to something called the tonicity of the solution. So tonicity means basically how much sucrose is in that bag or in, in that beaker, or is in that beaker. That's tonicity. Okay, so in today's lecture, we focused on basically why do membranes exist? How do they enable life to exist? What's the point, right? And really, again, if you realize the point is that if we have membranes, we can separate the inside of the cell from the outside. And so if we have, uh, you know, different amounts of solutes on the inside is on the outside, we have a gradient, right? Concentration gradient, as molecules pass back and forth across the membrane because of that gradient, that allows chemical reactions to occur and that helps sustain life. As always, make sure that you know what these learning objectives are. Make sure you can execute those, you can do those, right, before you proceed to the next lecture.